May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you for having me. I grew up in the Episcopal Church. I imagine many of you grew up in some church, um, and you learned, as I did, the wonderful stories of the Bible, particularly those great old stories in the Old Testament about Adam and Eve and Noah and the ark and Moses and the people of Israel. You know, we don't have those stories in our uh, Bible and still read them and teach them because they're amusing stories with all kinds of interesting things happen. As Christians, we believe that these stories still speak to us in this day and time, although, for instance, in Moses' case, we're looking at 4,000 years later. So how can these stories come alive for us as the people of God in this time and place? I think lots of us... Um, look to the Bible for teaching and inspiration. Sometimes we find it, sometimes we don't. Um, and I would suggest to you that certainly those old stories that you've probably put on the shelf with your childhood can be a new inspiration for you at this part of your journey as you move forward because they are, after all, about human nature and about God's relationship with each one of us, even in 2013, because God does want a relationship with each one of us and has one to greater or lesser success, <laughs> depending on where we are in our journey, we don't have to be a Moses or an Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Lee, Rachel, Virgin Mary, whatever, for God to have a relationship with us and for God to have a purpose for us. If we are born into this world, God wants us here. God makes us and God has things for us to do and to be. Unfortunately, as human beings, it's really hard to figure out sometimes what those things are. And they're as unique to us as we are to each other. What God has for me to be a priest is not what God has for most of you. But I promise you, God does have something. Let's talk a little bit about Moses. How many people here have seen Prince of Egypt? There you go, okay, so you know who we're talking about, right? Well, the young people know, Prince of Egypt. Moses, of course, uh, began his life as an abandoned child. Um, his mother put him out in a basket on the Nile and the story tells us that Pharaoh's daughter found him and raised her, him in the palace with Pharaoh as her own child. You know, I always used to think that I probably was like a princess that had gotten misplaced, like in Columbia, South Carolina. I don't know about y'all. Have y'all ever thought, you know, maybe the wrong family got me? <laughs> so, you know, Moses has the opposite. He is really uh, from the slave people, but he gets to grow up in Pharaoh's palace. And we know from archeology span how grand that was with the art and the music, the uh, culture, just a fabulous, um, fabulously rich area to grow up in. And he was a, indeed a prince of Egypt and treated that way. Unfortunately, Moses uh, lost his temper one day and killed an Egyptian. And even his favored status as one of the princes was not enough to keep him from uh, 
ha being put to death if he hung around. And so he ran away. He ran away from that great life in the palace and all that he had known because he was scared and he wanted to save his life. He didn't want to die. And he g runs out and he goes into the wilderness where ultimately he becomes a sheep herder. And so we pick up Moses' story today, not in the palace with the gold and the jewels and the ladies, but indeed in the wilderness with a flock of sheep and goats by himself in the desert, no less. How far could you fall, right? <laughs> From Prince of Egypt to a mere shepherd living out in the open with smelly animals. Moses probably thought that once he ran away from Egypt, his life would be over as he knew it. That he had given up the very best part of his life and God had nothing else for him. But we know that's not true because we have the story today. He's out there and he sees something quite remarkable. What does he see? Hmm? Burning bush, right? Burning bush. That's kind of scary. <laughs> and the desert is known for strange things happening. I want to point out something to you about this story that no one ever points out, though. Moses paid attention to the bush. Now, Moses could have ignored it. He could have been so afraid that he ran the other way. He had his choices about what to do. And it is only when he says to himself, let me turn aside, let me go over there and see what's happening, that God speaks to him. So, so here you have a call from God that has to have a response. And when God calls people, when he called Moses, when he calls us, we have to respond in order to hear God. God does not make us respond. Just like God does not make us love him. If God made us love him, it wouldn't be love, would it? No. And so we have a choice when God speaks to us in all the various ways that God can still speak to pay attention or to walk away. I would say that probably most people, including us, walk away because it's scary when God wants you to do something. Moses turned aside to see what was going on with the bush and God spoke to him. Do you remember the Virgin Mary when the angel came to her? Part of the Christmas story? And the angel says to her what? You're going to have a baby, right? The Son of God? And she says, I'm not married. That's probably not good, right? You know, Mary could have said, uh, no, thank you, God. I think I'll pass. She could have. She had free will like we do. But she said, okay, if that's what you want, God. Now, how does God speak to people today? I mean, God could do a burning bush if he wanted, right? God can do anything. I think God speaks to us through other people. God speaks to us maybe as randomly as in a book we're reading where something hits us. Or speaks to us in our prayer life if we have one. God could even speak to you in church. Imagine that. God uses other people to speak to us. I think God uses the beautiful world outside 
to speak to us of his magnificence. And so God is really, I believe, speaking to each one of us all the time. And what percentage do you think that we even get? <laughs> pretty, would you say it's pretty rare for you to know that God's speaking to you? Yeah, it is. But we're human, right? And we're limited. We also have a whole, God has a whole lot of competition. <laughs> I don't know about you, but my family's good competition for God. And my friends are good competition because they're always wanting to do something. And I would rather do that than listen to God most of the time, frankly, okay? And so God is still doing that, but he's competing even worse with our culture. Because our culture is all about God not speaking or God not even existing, right? We, I mean, we hear it when the politicians speak to us. We might not want to, but we do, don't we? That's distracting from God, isn't it? How about celebrities? Dennis Rodman and North Korea. Excuse me. <laughs> right? We hear that. That's distracting. We have, God has a lot of competition. And we have a lot of fear. Suppose God did speak to me. What in the world would I do? God might ask me to do something I don't want to do. So if I don't pay attention, then I'm not going to have to do it. Or be it. Right? Yeah. I had a lady in my church and she said, she would always say, the only thing that she wouldn't do if God wanted her to do was go be a missionary in Africa. That was the only, that was her limit. God could ask anything else, but that was her limit. And I told her she better not say that. Because God also has a sense of humor, right? Of course. And so our fear and our distractions with the world and our own inner Life distract us from what God is trying to say to us. I don't mean just in this sermon, although you may be distracted now with other things. I mean as you go about the world and your daily life, and God tries to reach out and get your attention, and you don't see or you turn away intentionally. When I first felt called to the priesthood and I talked to a, a friend who was a priest about it, he said to me, oh, so you have a burning bush. And I said, what? And he said, that's your burning bush. It won't go away. And he was right. Because when God calls, sometimes it's not just once. It's over and over again for the same thing. How many people have had that happen to them? Yes, I see some people nodding. Because God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't walk away from us because we walk away from God. God wants to make that connection. God wants us to pay attention to whatever those burning bushes are in our lives. That's why God's trying to get our attention. But often fear gets in the way too. This story of Moses, I was talking to Bishop Curry about it this week. And you know, he always has an interesting take on things. <laughs> and what he said was, he had realized that in this story, when God comes to Moses and Moses responds by looking at the bush, and God says, well, you know, I've seen my people in, in Egypt suffer. I've heard their suffering. And I have come to free them from the yoke of Pharaoh so they can go to their promised land. And I know their suffering and all this. And Moses says to God in this conversation, well, I understand that you, you know they're suffering, you see them, you hear them, and you're going to bring them out of Egypt. 
But you notice that's all about you. It's not about me. You bring them out of Egypt. You're hearing them suffering. You're, you're, here, you know, you're, you're seeing them. And then you come and ask me to do the hard job? Uh, I don't think so, God. But God did ask him to do the hard job. He had to go back where he was facing a murder charge. And he didn't want to go. He was afraid. He also made lots of excuses. Like we do when God wants us to do something, right? I got to earn a living here. You know, let me raise my children, then I'll tend to that God. Or when I'm in a better financial position, God, I'll do that. We have, we have lots of things that we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. I would ask you this during this period of Lent, which is a period of self-reflection to... Think about all those burning bushes that, that you have passed by when you were out in the wilderness and God had a message for you. Think about all those times you chose the way of the world instead of the way of God. All the times that fear kept you from answering God's call to you for little things and for big things. As God told Moses, don't worry, I am going to send you into that den of vipers there, but I'm going to be with you. You don't have to do it all yourself. And when we respond to those calls from God, that's part of our deal too. We may not know what to do or how to do it, but God's promise is the same promise that he made to us in Jesus Christ. I'll be with you always. It doesn't depend on you. Just be obedient. Amen.